At the end of a particularly bruising week, not only for politicians, for federal politicians, for the government, but really for the whole country. I'm delighted that David Spears is with us this morning, as ever, the presenter of Insiders. And I'm glad you're with us as well this morning on YouTube too. So great to have you on board. David, good morning. Good to morning, see you. Virginia. Can't underestimate just how absolutely wearing and devastating and, and upsetting it's been for so many Australians. Yeah. And, you know, what you were just talking about there uh, and the, you know, the story of Mel, I think you don't need to talk to too many women in your life to hear these sorts of stories in the last couple of weeks being retold and, and, and coming up. It's just, it, it has touched so many uh, Australians. Um, and that's why it's been painful, not just for the, the principals involved in all of this, and we can get to them, but I think for so many uh, Australians as well. So yeah, look after each other, I suppose. Well, exactly. And that brings us to the challenge then of leadership, because in a situation like this, notwithstanding the fact that Scott Morrison finds himself at the centre of this maelstrom, mm. there is still a, a crucial role of leadership here in making the country feel heard and taken care of. Do you believe he's played that role well? Well, I think there's no denying that right now, against the backdrop of um, Grace Tame, uh, Brittany Higgins, other really brave women who've spoken out. Uh, there is this uh, reckoning being sought, at least, by so many women for misconduct, um, uh, abuse, assault, harassment that they have been subjected to and their inability to seek any sort of outcome or closure to this for various reasons and the legal system uh, and and you know the, the the story you just recounted of the difficulties in going to police all of this is being talked about now in a way that it hasn't been for a long time uh, it's been called parliament's me too moment i'm not sure if that's too glib but there, there certainly is a moment here uh, and i do think the danger for the government in the responses we've seen like digging in behind the ministers like saying no no, no the rule of law is the rule of law we can't have an independent inquiry. The danger for the government is that it's seen to be protecting a system that a lot of women think does not work for them. And also a system that is just a, uh, that needs its time to be exposed, me too moment or not. Yeah. Uh, every other institution in this country has had to have that reckoning. And if it hasn't, it will inevitably. Um, I'm surprised they weren't ready for it. Yeah, yeah, I, look, me too. And I, I think, um, uh, you know, the, even the reaction to uh, what we heard yesterday, Linda Reynolds, despite saying in Parliament how deeply concerned she was for Brittany Higgins on the day this story broke behind the scenes, uh, uh, calling her a lying cow in front of a number of staff. Um, that just uh, it presents this image of a, a two-faced uh, approach that mm. they're saying one thing in pub public about all this, you know, care and support and and another thing in private, and I just think that really undercuts uh, a lot of what what we're hearing. It was interesting speaking to Josh Frydenberg on the program yesterday, and like every other, you know, forward-facing senior minister, they're backing Christian yeah. Porter right in, and I I get that they they are going to say that publicly, even if they um, um might not you know privately believe that his position is is tenable. But he went on to talk about uh, the culture in Parliament House, and, and he was he was quite strong on it. Well, I certainly think the culture here needs to improve. This, after all, is the Australian Parliament and the rest of Australia looks to our workplace as an example and the culture uh, in this place uh, does need to improve and improve fast. So it needs to change so he can, he can observe mm. there. For how long can the Prime Minister insist that he does not have to have some sort of independent inquiry? I think the strength with which he ruled this out yesterday makes it virtually impossible for him to shift course now politically and um, back an inquiry. I mean, the sort of stuff he said yesterday, that holding an inquiry into Porter would somehow undermine our rule of law and democracy, that would crumble and you don't have to look too far from Australia to see. Which look, is a nonsense. It's over the top. But my point is, I just don't think given he's taken that very firm mm. position, and it's the position of many in the government, that he can now go with an inquiry. Look, perhaps we should talk a bit about this, right? Because I think there are difficulties, no doubt. It's not straightforward. Um, the, the High Court example, other workplaces that have held you know, independent inquiries, they are typically dealing with cases of harassment or misconduct, not a criminal allegation. I think we need to be clear about what sort of inquiry with Porter we're looking at. If it's simply looking at, is he fit and proper to be in cabinet and be attorney general? Okay. We, you know, you could do that, but if that is going to look at a criminal allegation of rape, how does it do that? 
and I think this is what the Prime Minister and others are getting to, and I do see there are difficulties there. Um, you but, know, but, but not impossibilities. Not impossible, not impossible, but some of the details are important. What is the standard of proof? Are witnesses compelled? Are witnesses available? Um, you know, are hearings open or private? All of these details would matter because we are in a bit of uncharted territory and dealing with a criminal allegation before uh, a, a body that's not the police. There are already precedents for you know the old fit and proper test. Yeah, that's true. But yeah. what's that going to? Will that incorporate the rape allegation? That's really what we're getting to. Sure, you know you could you could run the ruler over whether someone's fit and proper, um, but then do you run that ruler over everyone in cabinet? Do they, they all get? Sub but if it's going to look at the rape allegation, that's where it gets problematic. Now I'm not saying it's impossible, and you know I've certainly argued already this week. I thought it was the. Uh, the only way, uh, possibly, for Porter to be able to recover politically is to be mm. cleared by some sort of independent inquiry. But I just think you know, it's it's very hard to see the government agreeing to that now. Labor will keep up the pressure. This will become a ding dong battle when Parliament's back, and there'll be you know howls of hypocrisy from the government about Bill Shorten and so on. But I, I just think it's really hard to see the government agreeing to one now. It's very worthwhile. I mean, it's been put on the record many times anyway, but let's briefly just reprise that yeah. on the Bill Shorten matter. I mean, the key differences are, are substantial. Yeah. He was interviewed by police. Yeah. The complainant was interviewed by police. Yeah. The entire matter was examined as thoroughly as it could be in that situation, and the police decided to proceed no further. So there's key, key differences yeah. there. There are. Yeah. And, but, uh, but also, equally, and I think that's right, but I think equally, Labor at the time weren't suggesting that during that process, the Shorten stand aside they are saying Porter should stand aside here. So look, there, you know, there is some hypocrisy there, but yeah, it, they think, are very different. They I, I, are very I think, different. I think that's fair. I, I, think, I think it's fair to, to suggest that, you know, when a matter like that is, is being investigated, and stand aside. And maybe our aside. standards have shifted too. Maybe our yeah. standards have shifted since 2014 to now, you know, coming back to what we were talking about the moment we're in. But um, yeah, a different approach is being taken. That's a good acknowledgement. That's an important acknowledgement. I mean, everyone sort of clings to the past and goes, yeah, but you, yeah, but you didn't. Yeah. These standards and the conversation and the way that we appreciate these things as a society, it shifts and changes. It has to. Yeah. And, and, and the way you deal with it has to change as well. But look, but re just read it coldly and politically for me this morning, David. Um, does, does Linda Reynolds survive? Does Christian Porter survive? I don't know. I really don't. I think Linda Reynolds is very badly damaged. Uh, this, you know, lying cow. Sure, but you can say... Um, we all say things in private that um, you know we wouldn't say in public. That's true, but that sort of language at that sort of moment in front of your staff in your ministerial office about that office, sort of issue. I just honestly, um, I think her position, you know, uh, should rightly be under some question. Uh, but we know Scott Morrison again is backing her in. Doesn't want to, uh, you know, he doesn't like sacrificing ministers. We've learnt this in his time as prime minister, yeah. whether it's Angus Taylor, Stuart Robert. And now, um, and now these two. Anthony Albanese was asking the question rhetorically, what do you have to do in that government yeah. to lose your position? Christian Porter, I mean, I thought that press conference was one of the most extraordinary things I've seen. And, and because police didn't hold an investigation, couldn't hold an investigation, and, you know, we need to state that the New, New South Wales police are in a very difficult position here, given there's no... Uh, yes, they spoke to her uh, five times, I think it was, mm -hmm. but then she did say to them, I don't want to proceed with which the matter. Is, which is not uncommon. It's not uncommon. And then, you know, within 24, 48 hours, she'd taken her own life. So we can't guess what sort of turmoil she was going through. Terrible. But for the police, I'm just saying, it, it makes their position difficult in terms of proceeding with an inquiry. I think people understand that. Um, but for Porter then, not to have the avenue of that police inquiry, not to have the avenue of an independent inquiry to make his case, he's there standing on live television with journalists throwing questions at him. Um, you know, trying to explain his recollection of those events, giving what limited recollection he had. I mean, you know, who knows? There could be contradictions that come up from others at the time who were there. Um, it was such a, an extraordinary and messy uh, process that you think an inquiry might be fairer on him than what we saw uh, this week. Now, maybe the avenue here, and Samantha Maiden has done a terrific job with all of this again, is, is you know, written a piece saying uh, the coronial inquest that's been in considered South in South Australia yeah. um, might be the only way and the better way to do this. Now, typically, coronial inquests look at how someone died. Uh, but if the rape allegation you know, is looked at as part of that inquiry... Circumstances leading to, yes. Yeah, maybe that's that's 
some avenue here. But right now, it's very difficult to see what else is available. Because, Her you know, we've got to be fair on Christian Porter too. And I, I'm just saying, I thought... <laughs> Seeing him have to deal with those questions, it was not. A, that's not how these sorts of things should be dealt with. No, it's not. It was nonetheless incredibly surprising to, to learn that he had not in any way read the document, that he'd not asked for it, that he'd not said yeah. to the Prime Minister when the Prime Minister raised it with him. Just, just on Give that, it to I mean, me right now. Look, I just, I, on that, I mean, I know there's been, you know, suggestions that he should have been and Louise Milligan should have given him the document. I think while, while ever this was still before police, before they'd closed it, uh, I, look, I'm no lawyer, but I can see there's a legal difficulty in giving him the detailed allegations at that point. So I can understand why Louise and others didn't do that. Um, but since then, subsequent to that, uh, you know, yes, you would think there'd be more curiosity about the allegations and certainly for the prime minister not to have read the documents that were sent to him. Uh, yes, he forwarded them to police and that was the right thing to do, um, but not to read them himself and simply ask Porter, you know, are you guilty or innocent? Um, and accept that answer, I, I think that was a problem. So the government finishes these two weeks greatly damaged? Uh, look, I'm always loath to guess, you know, how much political damage something like this costs. I think, you know, our job is certainly to, um, you know, demand answers and, you know, uh, highlight uh, these sorts of issues where appropriate. Guessing about the political damage, you know, I suspect, yes, uh, <laughs> In my judgment, this will have cost them. They, they believe there's a lot of people out there who think, oh, the show trial, trial by media frenzy has sure. gone too far. And there absolutely. are people, there and you'd, are. Be, you'd be getting feedback like sure, that. Sure, absolutely. But I, you know, coming back to where we began, I also think you can't deny the moment that we're in and the very real impact this is having on so many women out there. And I think for that reason, yes, I suspect it will cause damage. And men too. Can I just acknowledge yeah, it? Women and men too. It's just been bruising for everyone. And uh as you say, and someone I think remarked yesterday on social media that it was, it's curious how every, every woman knows someone who has yeah. had gone through some sort of sexual violence, but no man ever knows a rapist. <laughs> I think that's a really interesting yeah. thing to reflect on this morning. Um, the, all of that smothered some really important news as well. And I actually felt a bit for Josh Frydenberg yesterday. He had a good <laughs> news story to talk about. And, and I was very willing to talk to him about it because I'm, I'm as delighted as anyone else to see that Australia really is economically coming through this pandemic and uh, recession better than anywhere else. Yeah, it's uh, perhaps it's remarkable. Not, not quite snap back, but it's it's pretty impressive. It'll do. <laughs> It'll do. <laughs> I mean, look, anywhere in the world and on the health front and the economic front, yeah, yeah. tick, tick. Yeah. Um, the other big news. So is, they're sort of killing their own good news story. You uh, know? Yeah, uh, yes, that, well, perhaps not deliberately, but absolutely. Yeah. Is. Aged care was the other big one this week. Oh, so important. Yeah. Perhaps not as straightforward as the good news on the economy. And I mean, just on that one, I, I think it's a little disappointing, in fact, that the Royal Commissioners were divided on so many aspects of how to fund and how to run aged care. They um, weren't divided on the fact that the system is just broken, though. They and were the not divided on to, that. And, you know, that there needs to be a hell of a lot more money and staff and qualifications and reporting and transparency mm. and regulation. But it didn't exactly. It, it was more a smorgasbord of recommendations than a clear roadmap for the government now to follow. And on the politics, uh, politics of that, it was pretty unseemly, wasn't it, that to contrast with Victoria, that, you know, you had it dumped on reporters, you know, after the hastily called press yeah. conference. There wasn't some big event and, you know, a, a recognition of the importance of this. It was, a, it was a doorstop with the media unable to see it before they could ask their questions. Uh, look, I know people won't have many, much sympathy for journos. Sure. But yeah, normally with budgets or anything, you know, economic, like a tax plan, the mental health plan even in Victoria, as you mm. say, there's what's called the media lockup, where you get a bit of time, an hour or two, maybe more if it's a budget day, to get across the detail before you then <clears throat> report it and subject the principals to questions. It goes to transparency and accountability. This is not the media whinging saying we wanted more time. It's so the questions that are yeah. asked are actually germane. Thank goodness. Anne Connolly was there. The God ABC. bless Anne Connolly. She did a terrific job. Didn't she, Jason? And just, you know, drilling the Prime Minister on... Yeah, um, had know, it all. Yeah, and what was in there and, and what wasn't in there and what the government would do. So, look, you know, the Prime Minister said there'll be plenty of opportunity for the questions on this. Let's hope there are.
Well, exactly, but the bar- dogs bark and the caravan moves on, right? Yeah. And you've got the next story and the next story. And particularly you guys, this week. Particularly yeah, this exactly. Week. Don't get to go back to it. Who's your guest on Sunday? Uh, good question. No, no, no. <laughs> I can't <laughs> confirm it just yet, but if uh, if it does come off, um, she will be very relevant to uh, all of the events uh, oh, this week. So. now you've got my attention. <laughs> Can you share with us the vaccine rollout plan and the date, please? Are you trying to get your hands on that too? Uh, oh, I'm still waiting for my jab. My nan had her vaccine oh, fantastic. Uh, the other day and she turned 100. So happy birthday, Congratulations. Nan. Oh, how was the birthday? I it didn't was ask. really good because I wasn't here last week. She, right. uh, no, it was terrific, but she got her jab the, uh, the, the day before the party and all went well. So that was good. But no, I, 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 uh, I don't know when we'll get ours. Um, oh, no, we're way down the line. It's not so much about that, but um, I, you can feel now in the community people going, all right, all right, all right. Just, just give us at least a timeline yeah. or, or start to talk to us about, look, you know, we'll have vaccination centres up there at the exhibition buildings and down there at whatever. And yeah, there's, it's there's all going to be okay. Absolutely no detail. And I'm starting look, I, to feel yeah. the lack of that. I would say, though, don't get too panicked by the news this morning of this batch. No, of we, we dispatched that this morning. Yeah, okay, you have. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we dispatched that one neatly. Uh, look, it's 250,000 doses. Mm-hmm. We're going to be producing 50 million of them here, which is really important. No, really. at the end of that, my, my incredibly civic minded listeners were basically the consensus view is oh, come on, we actually don't deserve those vaccines as much as other countries. It's really interesting, to, but that's interesting it's feedback because it's, it's a fascinating, this vaccine diplomacy. And yeah access who deserves it i mean you know that we're we're a victim of our own covid success exactly here exactly right so <laughs> so bless my listeners they've got their head screwed on there right which go. is terrific great to see you david thanks virginia david spheres there don't forget to tune in for insiders with a mystery guest on sunday morning let's talk whether michael efron is with you now from the bureau hi michael hi virginia well it's gray out here what's it like where you are yeah, grey as well in Docklands and quite chilly as well. We've had a southerly winds following 